we're going to talk today a little bit about physical retail. You know, so much has been said already about the explosion of online retail over the last year. Um, we thought it might be interesting to have a conversation about the physical aspect of it. You know, by some estimates, um, when we're talking about online retail, it grew by 44% over the last year to $861 billion. It's 21.3% of retail sales in the U.S. Amazon sells almost $5,000 every second, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Um, believe it or not, this surprised me, one in, third, one in three Americans have an Amazon Prime membership. But what's been interesting is we've been doing a little bit of research here at Ipsos over the last year, and we're seeing some interesting tensions. And we're starting to see, I think, a little bit of crack, a few cracks in the armor of online retail. Um, the Federal Trade Commission last year reported that online shopping was the number one national list of COVID-19 related consumer complaints, even adjusted for the increase in online shopping. Um, and here's something interesting. We did a, a piece of research last summer as people were doing omni-channel shopping. Um, and we started to see, this is very interesting. So people who did buy online, pick up in store. So we call it BOPIS, right? So you go online, you buy the product and you go to the store, you pick it up. If it's a grocery store, they drop it in your trunk um, and you're off, you don't have to contact with anyone, right? We found that over a third of people that did this actually then parked their car and then went into the store or they took the bag that they just picked up in that store and went into the store. And so what this is really revealing to us is that there's some, some aspect of it that's missing um, that online isn't completely fulfilling for people, right? If you think about this as well, um, this is, now this is research we did just before COVID, but this is interesting that 49, only 49% of shoppers were in a task mode, meaning they were looking to acquire a good, bring it home, right? They were only interested in accomplishing the task. Other people were looking for aspiration. They wanted to learn something. They wanted to have a social aspect. Um, so more, the majority of shoppers, when they're shopping, are actually looking for something other than just accomplishing the task. And I think what's even more interesting is if you look by generation, the younger the, um, the, younger the shopper, the less likely there's going to be in task mode. And so I think going forward, I think what's interesting for us to really talk about is what is the future of physical retail? And to do that, I have three amazing panelists. I'll introduce to them one by one. Um, and I'd love, in your, after I introduce you, just to tell us what your thought is on the role of physical retail in the future, maybe five to 10 years from now. Okay, so let me start with Barb. Barb leads Marketplace Insights at Levi Strauss and Company, um, where she works cross-functionally to apply insights to inform how Levi's goes to market. Prior to Levi's, Barb was the director of Global Insights at Clorox Company. She's also serving as the board member of the Advertising Research Foundation, where she has also served as the board chair. So, Barb, tell me, what's your perspective on the role of physical retail in the future? Five to ten years from now is your question? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> that seems like... 40 to 50 years from now in these times. So I think I think it's super hard to you know, gauge what five years out would be. I think a couple of years out is even very difficult. Yeah. But um, I, I do think I guess just overall physical retail will still have a place. You know, there's been so much discussion about online and online growth. And I know we'll get into some more of that, but I'm a firm believer and have done tons of work in stores as well, that people need to go out to stores and touch things and see things and make decisions out there as well. So Omni will continue to be important. I think there's a lot of convenience and efficiencies that can put in for folks. Mm -hmm. uh, and then, you know, online will continue to be important, but it's not that the store is dead. Fantastic. Well, good. And I suspect, James, you might have a Similar perspective, um, James Cook is the Director of Retail Research at Jones Lang LaSalle, one of the world's largest commercial real estate uh, leasing development advisory companies. At JLL, James leads the retail research team, and he's also host of the Where We Buy podcast and the Everything We Know About Retail show on YouTube. So, James, five to ten years from now, what's your sense of physical retail? Yeah, I mean, I think I'm in line with Barb, I think about it in terms of the distinction between physical and digital going away. And it's almost like there is just retail. And then, you know, we have this idea that the medium is the message, that there's a physical message and a digital message. It's really the brand is the message, regardless of, mm. of whatever medium. It's funny, I'm sitting here in an office that's in a shopping area, and I look out the window, and there's a um, American Eagle. And a year ago, they didn't have click and collect. And now you look right out the window and they have designated parking spaces 
for uh, click and collect orders. And we sort of flash forward into this new world very quickly in the past year. And in a lot of ways, it's really exciting. Like we're getting the digital conveniences that we were promised finally. Can you can you count for me, James, how many people click and collect and then go inside the store while you're there? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm sitting I'm not sitting at the window right now, but I'll go hang out there after <laughs> Fantastic. Um, and finally I'd like to introduce Karen Wargo. Karen Wargo is a partner at Ipsa Strategy 3, where she leads our retail practice. She works with um, retailers across the spectrum like Target, Nordstrom, Tiffany, and Sonic. Prior to joining Strategy 3, Karen held leadership positions at Pfizer, Pepsi, and was a consultant at McKinsey & Company. So, Karen, tell me about what you think about physical retail in the future of it. Yeah, no, absolutely. I think it's got a big role to play. And if you go back to that um, chart you showed initially of task mode versus all the others, physical retail five, ten years will continue to play a role in both. I think it's it's both about convenience and discovery. So. All those folks in task mode, it's not that that's just solved online, right? Physical retail can be much more convenient, but they need to up their game, right? So that I don't have to go in to add things that I couldn't add at the last minute, right? Um, if I think about um, things that have advanced, when you think about buy online, pick up in store, I can go to a store now knowing they have the two potential shoe so uh, sizes mm -hmm. for my daughter who needs lacrosse shoes tomorrow. Um, right now in COVID, I try them on in the car, and then I go in and I return the one that doesn't fit, right? Five to ten years from now, I'd love to show up there and have them both waiting for me, um, and then quickly just transact that. So that's the convenience example, but physical retail, a lot of the hacks that are happening now can address and become incredibly convenient. And then, then certainly, you know, all the things on the right of this chart, right, aspiration entertainment, for me, it's, it's largely in a discovery bucket. And that role, as I think you see a lot of, will continue to be there. And as people do more revenge buying, as we're excited to be back in store, um, you know, so it, to me, it's really the two halves of the circle and physical yeah. retail five to 10 years from now should be playing a big role, both convenience and discovery. Great. Thank you. And, you know, Karen, you talked about discovery. Um, it's probably something, and Barb, you, you're, you're at Levi's. That has to be something that's a huge part of your, what, what Levi's sells, right? It's not just the gene itself, but how it fits, how it feels, how it makes you feel. Um, tell me a little bit about kind of how you're thinking about, you know, that part, the discovery part in the future and how you're, how the stores will kind of be structured in the future and what you're thinking about and what you're envisioning to the extent that you can. <laughs> oh, okay. So um, I, I don't think discovery is new, you know, when you say about thinking about it for the future, because discovery has been there for a very long time, especially in certain spaces, too. So I think very important in apparel, any player, you know, that people want to go out and again, touch and see and try on. And then also you can think about that, too, even in grocery, too. I think there's aspects of grocery, like if you look at produce and you have people who really want to go touch and see and choose those things. Uh, when I think about discovery in that space, too, I mean, I'm from Rochester, New York, originally in Wegmans is the grocery store there. And that place has always been phenomenal and built in pieces of discovery that you know, then flow to a bunch of other players too. Yeah. So I do think it's something that if people innately want to do, not everyone though, because I'm also a firm believer in there's different segments of consumers who very much want in and out convenience. They don't want to go right. shopping and perusing or spend an afternoon doing it. So I think we really have to think about meeting different consumer needs as well. Yeah, you. Um, interesting. You mentioned Rochester, New York. Um, we've been doing a lot of reading, and you're reading a lot of. You know, COVID. It's going to be the rise of the secondary, medium-sized towns. Um, the, the, you know, the the revival of downtown Main Street was really kind of something that happened um, on its way um, before before COVID. But now we're hearing a lot of people moving away from New York, from Los Angeles, to these smaller, medium-sized towns. Does that mean um, there's going to be a bright future for downtown physical retail, mom and pop shops, um, high street shopping, people working from home, there's lunchtime traffic perhaps? Karen, what's your perspective on that? It's, it's a great question. I mean, in, it, on the one hand, right, everybody on this, this, this call, we're all working from home, but we've actually, you know, we've done some research, right? And at the height of the pandemic, sort of workers, about 40% of workers were working from home, and now it's down to 25% working from home some of the time, right? So then as you expect some normalization, it's probably going to be, you know, about 10%, right, as, as half go back, right? Best guess. 
That's a big bump for downtowns, but I don't think it's it's as seismic as it might feel. But if you yeah. go back to what was fueling the original, you know, booms of these main streets, it's that freelance economy, right? If you go to the coffee shops, and you certainly are going to see a lot of folks wanting to get out and more. Mm-hmm. So, you know, if you have, if you know, asked, I think there is a bump. There is an influx um, for sure, both away from the city um, and from home. Um, but you know, who's going to benefit, right? You know maybe a coffee shop, although you're going to sell somebody who's there all day a $3 coffee. Um, so that that's the the question. I think that's one where we've got to really watch the signals on it. Yeah. And maybe, James, what is, what is your thought? You're the one who's watching all this, the money coming in and out of this commercial real estate space. What are you seeing? Yeah. I mean, for the past year, the place that's hurting the most is city retail, you know, in the CBD, because we haven't had tourists and we haven't had office workers. And... Mm. They're not back yet, but the sh- the green shoots are appearing. We're seeing more announcements of um, employers setting dates to return people to, to offices. We um, survey Fortune 500 office users, and our current forecast is that by the end of this year in the CBD, so we're talking about the highest density office employing areas like um, in San Francisco and Manhattan, that occupancy will be back to about 80% of pre-COVID levels, um, which I mean is similar to Karen's point. It's not a return 100% to normal, but it's getting there. It's enough where you can support retail again in the city. Got it, got it. And and this idea of central business district, dense areas, I know Levi's tends to open stores in kind of high traffic areas. Um, Barb, is that gonna continue given kind of what you're seeing here? Um, so, I mean, we have stores in a range of areas. Yeah. So when you consider the stores that are in the cities in a flagship mode or else also outlet stores that are in different locations as well. And inevitably, I think you see out there a range of players are assessing where should they be. I mean, James knows this very well, and I'm sure Karen does too. And so you think about what makes sense, what locations, and there's a lot of change ha- happening in the landscape period. Mm-hmm. So obviously considerations. Yeah, and so, you know, you, you mentioned this, you know, range of locations. I know one thing we talked about before was this idea of destination shopping, right? Creating something that it's, you know, if people are not going to go out as often, maybe because of COVID or kind of still lingering effects of COVID, um, do we create larger experiences that are people willing to go a little bit further, spend a little more time doing exploring, discovering? Um, what is your sense of the, the future of the task oriented shop versus a, like a long term, longer stretch of discovery experience destination shopping it's probably big in apparel so so to clarify though you're you're asking about future of destination or future of destination what's your sense i I think there's probably a few things some of the things from ipsos from your organization itself in terms of at this point with COVID and, and where it is across this country, you have some people who are already out there, right? There's parts of the country which are pretty open. James knows this very well, um, for one, where people are out in stores and, and doing some of that already, right? And then you have other parts of the country where there's more, let's say, shelter in place. I'm in the Bay Area. I'd say we're a place that is not out as much as certainly like Texas, where my son is. And so you're going to have that flow and traffic a little bit different. But I, I think over time, as people get more comfortable to um, per Ipsos, you know, this concept of the penguin, like who's going to go out first or others going to follow? When are people going to start transitioning? We'll see that stuff. And discovery will be part of it because I think that's also pent up. So if you think about, you know, we talk about Gen Z a lot. Everybody does. And folks will say, well, they're all digital. They want to be on their phones and shop on their phones. They want to be out in the stores. They want to go out with their friends. They are missing those experiences. And they're not the only ones. The majority of people want to go in store and shop. So you know, still there, we'll be coming back. Yeah. So then what's going to, where is all this um, excess real estate? What's going to happen to that? Like you, we hear, James, a lot about, you know, the huge glut of commercial real estate out there with all these stores closing. Um, what is your sense on how that space is going to be? You hear about a lot of malls becoming, you know, schools or hospitals. Like, what is mm-hmm. what is all this excess commercial real estate? What's going to happen to it? 
Yeah, I mean, it's true. Unfortunately, we've sort of had um, decades of um, unbridled development of retail real estate, and we've got too much of it now. I think you definitely see that in the mall sector. Every every metro needs a few good class A malls, which are just going to continue to do fine. Um, we have no worries about, uh, you know, the good the the good destinational malls um, and some markets can can support a few of them. The problem is that you've got um, especially in in A and B markets, you know, primary and tertiary markets, you have these B and C malls that you don't need because now people are going to the power centers, which have mm -hmm. the stores that they need, and they're more in their loop because they're going to Target and then next door is Ross Dress for Less and TJ Maxx and Marshalls. And so malls that have the mid-range department store with the um, mid-price apparel, it's just not appealing. So what happens to that? All kinds of stuff. There's a mall in um, uh, North Carolina that's uh, going to become the new uh, office location for Epic Games. There are malls that are going to be uh, medical, hotel, mixed use. We've been working on a lot of mall redevelopment projects and it really runs the gamut. It just kind of the, mm -hmm. the location defines what it's going to be. The one thing I should say we haven't seen a lot of is industrial. Everybody wants to do it, but it's very tough to put a mall in, in a neighbor. Or I'm sorry, to put an industrial building in a neighborhood. People don't want that. <laughs> so it sounds like there's going to be a bigger split between suburban, urban, class A, class B that, that you're seeing. Right. Yeah, right. So if you're talking about like an enclosed mall or a lifestyle center, which is like a nice outdoor shopping area, um, it's going to be the destinational place we go on the weekend for fun as a family. And then everything else is more sort of transactional and daily needs oriented and that middle of the road stuff that we used to have. Like when I was a kid, there were just a lot of like, um, you know, enclosed malls that you were going you know, on a much more regular basis, I think a lot of that goes away. Gotcha. Mm -hmm. And so maybe a question for Karen, then if you're a mid tier retailer, right. Um, what, what, what is your recommendation on what, what kind of how they should move forward? Right. If you're not, you know, if you're not a Tiffany or a Louis Vuitton and you're not, you know, a Ross, but you're somewhere, you're an Aeropostale or an Abercrombie, let's say, um, what is your sense on what, what they should do? Do you have high level, right? Of course, the specifics are important, but high level on what, what your sense is. No, it, it goes back to um, what's the role in their life, right? How are you meeting them where they're at, right? So if it's if it's a an enjoyable outing, right? How how do you be part of those other activities and make it a destination, right? So if you're not naturally going to be part of the flow of where they're at anymore, how do you draw them in, right? And it's it's all about that relevancy. And I think one of the key things that's happened, particularly in the pandemic, is even more direct communication, right? So if you've established that relationship, right? I mean, it's interesting. I just got an email from a brand I had purchased with, which was, hey, we just closed X location. You can still find us at that. I never would have noticed, but because I had also um, – been with them online, it was that full circle. So this, I think, goes back to as this real estate changes, right? How do you make this seamless, both omnichannel and in person? And what's the role that you're, you're what is your customer looking for you from that physical retail, right? Is it about um, return sizes, experiencing the product, um, and making sure that that's clearly how you're drawing them in. Because right, real estate strategy is is, is one piece um, for it, um, but then it's really depending upon how do you fit into their lives. And I do think brands have more ability to um, keep that relationship doesn't have to be about complete physical proximity anymore. Um, I think years ago it would have to be, you only got to them if they happened to be driving by, but if you're really doing the right things, um, even if you're in a mall that may be closing, you can draw them in elsewhere. Gotcha. And just finally, maybe Barb, before we jump into questions from the audience, um, are there certain categories that you think are going to have kind of stronger bounce back with retail? You know, we talked a lot about apparel, you, you know, we talked about you know, toys, baby stuff, you know, fast food even, coffee, right? Are there certain categories that you think are, are better suited to be more experiential, want more retail space um, mm -hmm. that actually might benefit from this? 
So aside from the ones that we touched upon, I think about also some of the home goods as well. Now I know that that's really exploded during this time and as people are redoing things in home, but I um, just using my own anecdotes, I think about things like, you know, carpets or some furniture or things that you really want to touch and see the quality of and think about rather than getting something very large shipped to your home. So for example, looking for a new closet setup for my son, I can go on Amazon and see many choices. I'm sure there are plenty of good ones, but do I want all that shipped to my home and not have it work out and then figure out how I'm going to get it back? Yeah. So that seems kind of behemoth to me. So having those types of home stuff, yeah. you know, rooms where you can really work with somebody to help you on that, figure out that you're getting the right thing. Again, touch, see, feel quality, make those choices and not deal with the hassle of returning which the majority of people think is a pain to have to return things. Yeah, no, I think the return, the return thing is a huge challenge in, in this omni-channel world, right? There's as many ways as you can, and now Kohl's is taking Amazon returns, and I think mm -hmm. the, kind of the mixing up of it all is um, it's going to be an interesting area to probe on. Um, Wendy, I see questions coming in. Do you want to share with us what uh, some of the audience is asking? Yeah, we do have a couple of questions. Um, cool. First question is, will we need more or less retail space in the future? Oh, simple. Um, what, Barb, why don't, you, why don't you take that first? <laughs> I would venture less. Uh, so as mentioned, as James notes, there was already a lot out there even prior to COVID. And then with just the shifts to e-com and so forth, less. Well, that's not good for you, is it, James? <laughs> <laughs> oh no, it's it's absolutely fine. I think it's it's less uh, retail real estate, but more high quality. Um, and so it can mean a lot of things. But I mean, stores, you know, for a while, big boxes were getting bigger and bigger. Now we're realizing they don't need to be that big. But what's there needs to have value. And another thing too is um, now stores can be fulfillment centers as well. Mm -hmm. So there might be part of that store that isn't selling space anymore, but it's used for, for ship from store. Cool. Karen, you, you think less? I do, for, for those the same reasons, right? The, the forces were so so strong before and they're only getting stronger. Yeah, okay, well, that's a uh, unanimous. Okay, yeah. <laughs> so another question's come in. Store success has been measured in sales per square foot historically or gross margin per square foot. What are the new metrics that retailers need to start thinking about? The metrics, interesting. Um, well, what metrics do you look at, Barb? So I don't think that um, sales per square foot, and that will be irrelevant. I, I think you know those will still be on the radar. I do think it's interesting, well, there's experiential metrics too, to think about. Of course, there's satisfaction, um, are people returning? How was that experience? How engaged were they? Uh, are folks talking about it on social? Did they love it so much that they have something to share if you have a very experiential uh, type of in-store situation? Uh, I think also with the Omni, it'll be interesting to track more about or understand more about, okay, what did I do at home? What did I engage in? In the Omni types of tools available as well as in line. And just more service and sort of curation for folks as well. Yeah, Karen, are you hearing things from your clients that are, you know, what are the, what are the new things we need to measure? What are other additional um, metrics or additional benchmarks we need to hit besides sales per square foot? You know, I, I think it, it it's just it absolutely needs to be broader, right? When you think about those frontline team workers who are spending, whether it's time mm -hmm. returning or fulfilling, right? It's folks want to be, um, from that perspective, you have to have that right set. And is it the broader area of any sale that's sold to the, the broader zip code, like some retailers are doing, right? Um, but shifting folks to, um, when you think about the internal piece, right? Um, how productive is it for the, the, the broader Omni P&L, not just the store P&L? And that's, I think, a big shift that it can't just be, um, you know, what you bag from that store. Yeah, you you start saw you start started to see that a lot when the Omni thing was was growing. Some store associates would be reluctant to tell you to go online because then they wouldn't get their, mm -hmm. their commission for it. And I think there's a bit of a tension there as as we as we. Well, they want to take returns because it was actually way back when, right? It was just coming off of theirs, and that's very um, 
destructive. <laughs> yeah. Um, any more questions, Wendy? I think we have time. Yeah, for one, one just came in. Um, what, what role do you see technology playing in the in-store experience? And I know that's pretty broad, so maybe what new technologies or what trends in technology? Sure. And James, you, I'm sure you're involved in you know, a lot of retail design stuff. Uh, what's, what are you hearing in the, in the technology realm and what requests are your clients are giving you? Well, I think going back to the theme of the convergence of physical and digital, I just... Uh, you mentioned um, our uh, podcast, Where We Buy. Our latest episode this week, we talked to uh, a group, Volumental, where uh, you go into a shoe store, they scan your foot, and then artificial intelligence tells you when you're looking at shoes how likely it is to fit what size you should get. Because, you know, sizes aren't standard. I mean, we've had sizes for hundreds of years, but they're still not standard. Um, yeah. And... Uh, so I think there's a real opportunity there. I mean, Karen was talking about trying out shoes in her car. Uh, wouldn't it be great if you just bought shoes or clothing and knew that it would fit? I think that's a great opportunity for technology. Well, that sounds like a question exactly for Barbara <laughs> when you're talking <laughs> about jeans. Um, right. What, what do you think about the convergence of uh, technology and, and physical retail? And, and it's, so, cool thing some that technology, <laughs> so some of that technology has been out there you know, for a bit with scanning your size and trying to match and so forth. So uh, have, I haven't seen it taken off yet. I think there's certainly opportunity for that yeah. as well. I do think the things, you know, as we've talked with some of the Omni pieces, I agree with, certainly with Karen about you want to know that the stuff is in store versus making a track and, you know, when you're more mission based as well. Uh, if, if something's not there, you want to see other options as well, different colors, different washes, et cetera. How can you also see that in store and have that sent to your home? You know, as you find something that fits that you really love. Uh, I do think we, for example, have tailor shops, which you can customize product. And there are some ways that technology can help you visualize that that exists in our stores already. So, and that is part of the experiential piece. So um, certainly opportunities and that will continue to evolve. Great, well, fantastic. Um, I wanna close on one thought. Uh, I'm gonna share my screen again and just, can you confirm with me that everyone sees the new, this image? Yeah. So, um, I think sometimes the best way to think about the future is to take a little look at the past. Um, this is a stone carving from Ostia, which was an ancient Roman town about uh, 45 minutes outside of Rome. And it shows, it was discovered in archaeology, and it shows a retail scene from almost 2,000 years ago. And I think what is so powerful about this is there's so much familiarity to it, right? If you look here on the left, you see... Uh, group of two gentlemen who are not really shopping, but they're having a discussion, they're debating something, there's this social element to it, right? There is this transaction happening here in the middle. And then most interesting, I think here on the right of this um, stone carving, you see there's two monkeys and two rabbits. And what the ancient Rome, Romans knew and what they believed is that, um, cleverly enough, entertainment and drawing people into the store um, would, would increase sales. And so they used to find monkeys, people still find monkeys today very entertaining. And so they would keep monkeys in, and rabbits in the shops as a way to entertain um, shoppers and bring them in. So, you know, the, the learning here for us might be that there, you know, some aspects of shopping will remain with us, um, driven by consumer preferences for discovery, for entertainment, um, for things other than I want to acquire the good. Right. And you know, COVID-19, Amazon's domination, omnichannel shifts, all of that notwithstanding. Um, I think there's a lot of what's familiar that will probably continue on into the future. So with that, I'd like to thank Barb, James and Karen for the thought provoking conversation today. And I hope everyone who tuned in um, took away some powerful insights from our discussion. Thank you. Thank you all.